All right. Today we're here with my brother, Ben Gillenwater. Ben is the head of technology for Starting Strength Gyms. Um, I wanted to talk to Ben today because we've made a bunch of decisions at Starting Strength Gyms about how to use technology and maybe more importantly, how not to use technology. So when it's appropriate, when it's not. Um, and Ben has a lot of experience. We're lucky. You know, there aren't many gym franchises at our stage that have this level of expertise. So um, you all know Ben from the podcast with Rip, from some of the episodes with Nick. But uh, today we'll get to know Ben a little bit better and we'll talk about tech. So, yeah. Welcome, yeah. Uncle Menchie, Thank as you. our three year old niece calls you. Uncle Menchie, yep. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's true. A lot of what, a lot of the things we've chosen not to do with tech are just as important as the things that we've chosen to do. For sure, yep. I think that uh, comes with um, uh, expertise and like a long time of being exposed to something or a topic as you find out how to minimize it and still achieve results. Right, you can avoid the bright, shiny object syndrome, which uh, I remember you telling me a story of your time at Northrop um, where the, the executives would be easily dazzled by whatever the sales rep vendor would come in and, yeah. and, and try to get them excited about, even if it had no actual utility. But it was really expensive, used yeah. a lot of budget, and it was real flashy, right? Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So, the sales team at Apple was the best. They brought our entire executive technology team into their headquarters in uh, San Francisco or whatever. What's it? Mountain View or Cupertino? Cupertino, Cupertino. yeah. And uh, speaking of podcasting, they sat our most senior guy, our, our corporate CIO, down and had him record his own voice and do a podcast just, <laughs> just to play with his ego. And he was on board. He's like, tell me where to sign. What, I'll, I'll buy everything. What percentage of government budget decisions are made based on ego? Uh, 99.9. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of our buddies, uh, hello, Connor, if you're watching this, asked me the other day if I was on the same level of technical understanding of Ben and like how that compares to our differences in, in his understanding of business, for example. Uh, let's just say no. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a deep chasm. There's a difference between what I do and what Ben does. So I'm on the the tech side of business and I'm becoming more of a generalist now with the franchise company because it's not a tech company. And Ben is on the business side of tech. Um, but Ben is one of these people who understands how things work at a detailed level. Um, it's not a surface level understanding. You know, if uh, we, we could sit here and talk about the, the seven layers of, what do you call it, of network or the internet or? There are uh, OSI layers. OSI like, layers. The, the things that compose all the technology that we interact with and all the way down to the physical components, all the way up to the virtual um, interface that you see on your phone or on your computer and everything in between. And that stuff's really interesting and maybe we'll do it someday when we're running out of topics, but um, Ben kind of understands <laughs> the full stack from top to bottom. Um, so, so it's interesting to have that level of expertise on the team. And um, you know, we, I wanna talk to you, Ben, about the decisions we've made, the tech that we have, um, but I want to start each of these interviews out with some something relevant to strength training because mm -hmm. there's a, a reason why a guy like me left my career and took a huge risk to do the Starting Strength Gym franchise. Yeah. There's a reason why a guy like you, who has unlimited options in the technology space, um, decided to spend most of your time uh, with us. Mm -hmm. um, so we appreciate that, by the way. And, and the franchisees with Ben's support and the members at the, the end of the whole you know, of everything Ben puts together for the experience, get the benefit from that. So let's, let's start and talk about kind of the purpose, the strength training stuff. So what, I've got my view on this, but what, um, uh, what would you say starting strength has done for you in, in your life? If you could, if you could summarize that. And starting strength has shown me that it's, so it's interesting in the context of technology, right? Like I'm used to interacting with technology in a way where I can take an existing system and adapt it to fit a use case or fit a scenario. But the system itself generally stays the same and I work within the bounds of that system. But I found that starting strength for me, for my physical, my physical system, uh, has allowed me to actually expand the boundaries of my physical system. So it's allowed me, it's, it's allowed me to physically adapt to, to the stresses of having the bar on my back in, in ways that I didn't, I had no idea that 
people could get stronger. I thought that people on magazines and in movies that are strong were just always like that. Same. Yep. And uh, so now I, I carry on average 30 to 35 pounds of extra mass. Uh, I have no way to measure it. Most of it, I think, is muscle. Um, that I, I am a bigger, stronger person than I used to be. And my, I think my baseline, if I understand it correctly, my baseline strength, if I was to, for whatever reason, stop lifting or something has probably increased. Like my, the, the You're adaptations. Different. You're a different person. Yeah it's, yeah, it's crazy. Like it's, I, I now know that you can physically change in yep. amazing ways. Absolutely. And I, I've, I've, <clears throat> I, I survived a, a pretty intense motorcycle crash um, with basically zero injury. I bruised a rib um, after like tumbling down a dirt path at 50 miles an hour. And usually if your body tumbles, that's when it starts to just t break, <laughs> right? Who knows? I didn't run the test of, of crashing before starting strength <laughs> just to see how I would have reacted differently. But I think my body is uh, stronger. I'm able to do jujitsu in an environment that's that's fairly aggressive. That uh, I have to imagine that the reason I'm in one piece right now is due to the fact that I have additional uh, muscle mass, stronger tendons, denser bones, all the things that come along with it. Yep. So what starting strength has done for me is as as firstly helped me realize that like a lot more is possible than I ever thought was possible. Yep. Um, and then I can physically experience that myself versus somebody telling me about it or whatever. Like for me, if I can't properly learn something unless I get my hands on it and, and, and the process of learning how to get strong since I think you and I started doing it together in 2012, probably. Mm -hmm. I still have those videos. We just can't ever show them to anyone. Oh, the videos of us lifting with no clue, <laughs> like <laughs> self-taught <laughs> squatting this must have been terrible. One of the reasons why we started this gym project. Right. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Like, because if you, you either read the book and do it by yourself, uh, get lucky enough to live near a coach that you can hire and afford to pay, you know, privates, uh, or, or, or have somebody else tell you what to do, and then they're going to be wrong. So, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it's been interesting for me as Ben's brother to watch him grow. And I've obviously grown right alongside him. Um, well, maybe we'll put a cover photo of us in uh, when we we're working in Southeast Asia. Of yeah. us, you know, I was eighty pounds lighter. You were however many pounds lighter. Yeah, 30, 35 pounds. Right. Um, so Ben Ben's a computer guy. He's a technical guy. Um, when technical guys first started getting into jujitsu, you know, they they figured out a system that could enable them to be dangerous and to be able to, to be able to protect themselves. And now you have just a universe of nerds that are total weapons, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So starting strength is that, but for strength training. Um, and it's been really interesting to see a, a, a mind like Ben's um, understand this process, commit himself to this process, and then benefit as a result. And now, you know, the skinny technical computer guy, uh, who's still a white belt in jiu-jitsu, but um, you uh, can make it a really tough time for a black belt to, to stay mounted on you, for example. Um, yeah, I can put a lot of power, like I, I can, my hips in particular, that entire center section of my body that surrounds my hips has uh, a notable amount of power. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool to experience as a, as a training partner and it's pretty cool to watch as, a, as an observer. Um, so yeah, profound changes to your, to your existence, improved quality of life. Um, yeah. your, your dating pool has expanded much like mine had, um, <laughs> yeah, like walking, walking through the world bigger and stronger and more confident. And, uh, cause it's the mental thing, you know, Ripito and, and everybody involved talks about like the mental component of doing hard things. And it's true, man. Like I know that I can do much harder things cause I've done them right. physically yep. than I had in the past. And and uh, it's cool to walk through the world like that and, and know that I can manipulate the world around me in different ways as a result, if necessary, or just in how I carry myself. Yep, absolutely. So that's the summary of, of uh, what Starting Strength has done for Ben. Let's get into um, technology. Let's talk about the topic of the show. So um, I have a consulting background. Um, I had to do some consulting on the side as, a, as an entrepreneur early on trying to make ends meet. And part of that consulting was helping companies choose software to solve problems. And so when I built out the strategy for starting strength gyms, 
um, me being a former uh, tech startup guy, I started a lot with the technology and I mapped all that out. I mapped out the, the problems we needed to solve for each person, uh, e each, each audience or each user type. Um, and then I mapped out what I thought those solutions should be. And then I basically just passed my ideas to Ben and he made them a whole lot better. So essentially we have a whole bunch of software as a service tools that we use. Uh, which is good because Ben will will hopefully reinforce this. But if but if you're ever faced with the idea of whether you should build something or buy, you should almost always buy, especially if you can get it to to fit your your needs. And now there's a SaaS software as a service for everything. So we have a bunch of SaaS, and then we made a very risky decision to build three applications. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, it's risky because as a new, the, the, the number one reason why businesses fail is because they run out of money. And so if you as a brand new business are saying that uh, I'm going to invest in technology, uh, especially if you don't know what that actually means long term, because it's not just building the thing, but it's maintaining it and upgrading it, um, you just increase your risk. So we, we were very bullish on this venture and we invested a whole bunch of money in tech up front because we thought tech would be a key differentiator. Um, so Ben, would you mind sharing with us the three applications that you and your team built and what they do? Yeah, so we've got a, a real boring one, which is a sign up application. So any of you out there that have signed up for a starting strength gym have used our sign up application. And it just looks like a website where you put in your name and credit card number and you know, what schedule you want for the gym. But the behind the scenes components of that are complicated. So there's a sign up system. There is a, uh, a TV system, uh, secondarily, that shows a couple things. It shows who's, we have two TVs in each gym. So one of the TVs shows who's working out in the, in the current session. What are their names? What are they lifting today? You know, which lifts, how much weight, how many sets and reps? Uh, and then who is gonna be lifting in the upcoming session? So like I lift in the 415 session at the Boise gym. So when I walk into the gym, I see my name up on the screen with what I'm gonna lift that I agreed I programmed it with my coach during my previous session. Uh, and then it shows me who's, com who's coming in at the, so mine set finishes at 5.45 and then the next session starts at six or 6.15. It shows me who's coming in next and what they're gonna lift. And then the second TV is a records board or a leaderboard where it shows who are the strongest, uh, the five strongest men and the five strongest women in the gym that I'm in. So for me, for Boise, uh, in each of the four major lifts, and then every 60 seconds it rotates and it shows a records board for the entire franchise. So you can see the name and the which gym and how much they're lifted. Again, top five men, top five women for each of the four major lifts. And then the third application we built is a logbook application. And that allows people to obviously record their workouts. Um, and that's the most... Uh, you know, transparent type of use case or not transparent, but most obvious. Um, and then the long-term component behind the scenes of the logbook app is that we can collect anonymized data that shows trends for how long it takes certain types of people to get certain levels of strong. Right. How long does it take the average 45 year old man to add a hundred pounds of their squat? How, you know, and what, what's the average starting point and what are the, What's the mean and the median and what are the outliers? And, and you know, if you send your 65 year old mother to the gym, to a starting strength gym, um, what might she expect in terms of commitment to uh, a certain amount of time to, to gain a particular level of strength as measured by weight on the bar? Uh, so those are the three systems, the sign up system, the TV system and the logbook system that we built from scratch that we did not buy from a third party that you know, we decided to do on our own and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and yeah. the and the expense doesn't go away no so this is purely a commitment to um trying to do things and that this is actually kind of the theme of the entire company it's like okay we get we interact with businesses that have low standards all day every day and we're frustrated by crappy products and services so if we have the chance to do something right, especially if the ethos of the thing we're doing, starting strength is you know high standards, high quality, what, what is uh, just blank slate? How do we make this thing as awesome as possible? How do we make the experience great? Yeah. And that, that is the reason why we built the signup app, for example. So the membership management software that we use 
had a sign up process that was what 13 steps yeah 12 or 13 steps it was and and by steps like separate screens where you like fill in information click next fill in information click next yep. get confused click next yep and and um but the membership management software met our list of requirements better than anything else on the market and building your own membership management software is basically a suicide mission as a new yeah. company. Yeah. So what do we do? Well, they have uh, APIs, which API stands for Application Programming Interface. And um, that allows you to put a different front end to manipulate their back end. So Ben and his team built this single screen, three step sign up process, which is super smooth, really fast. And we did that for selfish reasons because it improves conversion, which means pe fewer people get frustrated and, and uh, are more likely to sign up. And we also did that for member experience reasons. Mm -hmm. we, we did not enjoy going through the 13-step sign-up process no. ourselves. Yeah. So, so that is a horrible welcome to the Starting Strength Gym's experience. Like, hey, welcome. You know, you're going to spend $300 plus a month with us. And uh, by the way, um, bang your head against the wall while you try to navigate this, this ridiculous yeah. system. Yeah, your first impression of Starting Strength Gym's after all this promise of talent and, and experience and, you know, focus on, on quality. And then, and then you just leave and then you start frustrated, right, before you even get to the gym. It's like, that's not good. That's not good. Yeah. And it allowed us to do pre-sales so that, uh, you know, for example, right now, take Chicago is in the pro the Chicago gym is in the process of being built out right now. It's currently early December, 2021. And while the gym is being built, uh, John Frazier, the owner of the Chicago gym can sell spots and sell memberships in advance so that by the time his doors open, there's people there lifting and speaking of, you know, businesses fail because they ran out of money. So he can he can actually have some uh, revenue flow uh, promised on day one. Right. He might have uh, four or five figures in recurring revenue by the time he opens. Yeah. Which means the, the length of time that he has to spend getting to break even is much shorter. And so the membership management software that was out there um, did not accommodate pre-sale the way that we needed it to. Um, and it also, w since we're training, our members have to train on a schedule. Our members, unfortunately, can't just come in whenever it's convenient. Um, it, it's, it's essentially a personal training appointment that's recurring three times a week at the same time on the same days. And the membership management software solutions on the market um, were not set up for that because they're right. set up for the standard exercise model of the fitness industry. So, yeah. Yeah. so we had to build it. Um, yeah, and you, and you mentioned something very important, which is the, the, um, how mistakes in software development can cause financial issues for companies. And this is true, actually, regardless of the size or state of the company. Uh, technology mistakes can take down the biggest companies, they, and they can very easily and commonly do take down the smallest companies. Um, one thing that I learned... Or countries. <laughs> or countries. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There's no bound to the failures that technology can present when handled incorrectly. Um, and ironically enough... I learned some important lessons in that regard from one of the most inefficient organizations on earth, which is the US federal government. <laughs> um, because I, I did IT contracting stuff uh, for the US government for a while. And I learned that it's expensive to build stuff. It's expensive to implement stuff. It's expensive to buy stuff. It's way more expensive to maintain and look after and keep up to date and manage those things year over year, especially come five years down the line. Did you find out that you made a mistake that now requires you to rebuild the thing from scratch and it's full of bugs and you use technology that nobody is currently savvy on. So you have to, there's a pool of 25 people on the planet that can maintain your system. You know, there, there's, there's government entities that are still maintaining systems run on a, a thing called COBOL, which is like only experts in the 70s knew how to manage COBOL systems, and those are still around, you know. Now, granted, that's on decades scale, so that's different. But my objective for us as a small company, and small is relative, right? But like, technically speaking, you have like small companies, medium companies, large companies, and we're a small company. I don't know what the numbers are. Like, it's so many tens of millions of year in revenue. It, it depends on the state. It's usually defined by the number of employees. Uh, yeah. it's, just, it's defined differently. But small, let's just say, is under 100 employees. Yeah, so we're definitively small um, and have to be careful on all fronts of how much we pay when we buy something, how much we pay when we build something, 
and then particularly how much we pay when we maintain and manage something. And I was very careful to implement our technology and, and, and structure our technology choices in a way that we're not going to regret from a fiscal perspective. Which is a really good uh, skill set to have in life because yeah. when you get involved with the enterprise procurement process, um, you learn about this concept called total cost of ownership. And uh, that is a valuable thing to learn just as a consumer, as a person in life. It's like yeah. the sticker price only tells a part of the story and you have to look at the total cost of what that thing is going to um, run you to operate and maintain during its, its life cycle. And that actually may be several times more than the purchase price. Oh, yeah. Um, which is why Rip always says, don't buy used BMWs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get to experience the total cost of ownership Cor system. Correct. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's, it's uh, and then it, it puts me in a unique position of savvy, intelligent um, franchisees that we work with, who are our business partners and our friends who say, why doesn't it do this? And why doesn't it do that? And it's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a, a, a lengthy conversation around total cost of ownership. Because if we do just what we need to do and don't get too far ahead of ourselves in terms of trying to be too fancy or trying to do stuff just because it's, it's pretty or just because it's popular, um, then we can keep our overhead low, which keeps the company efficient, which keeps the gyms efficient, which allows us to persist and allows us to grow and therefore allows more and more people to get strong over time because we, if we exist as a company, then people can lift in our gyms. Right. Yep. And that, that is all that matters. Yep. And so the, the fundamentals are in place such that, uh, well, the, you know, the idea is, and I think we're doing pretty well so far, is that we will be able to maintain that kind of um, trajectory, have the things that we need, and, and have, a, have a very nice experience for everybody involved without regretting uh, like, man, why are we spending 15 grand a month on technology? Like, what the hell, you know? And the nice thing about being able to build this company from scratch is we had the opportunity to make sure all of the uh, incentives are aligned. So when Ben's talking about reducing overhead for the franchise owners, he's, he's talking about reducing their actual overhead, not the franchise company's overhead. Because the franchise yeah. owners are paying for the technology. Right. And our job is to create successful entrepreneurs and franchise owners. And we can only do that if they're making significantly more money than they're spending. And so we, we have a vested interest in keeping their costs down to keep uh, their, their profits as high as possible while not compromising the customer experience. And that is yeah. an unbelievably challenging balance to strike. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's fun for me because I've been in the IT business professionally since 1995. So how many years is that now? Like 20, 26 six years yeah. or something. From 95 until 2004, I was a full-time, hands-on, technical. Nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew my name. I spent most of my time in a data center, uh, which I really enjoyed. In fact, I miss that. <laughs> um, just being my, by myself in a data center and like managing servers and networks and stuff. And so I'm very like technically adept at, at managing complicated systems uh, of certain types. And then from that point forward, I started moving into more strategic roles and leadership roles and getting away from like, I'm no longer the guy manipulating the system directly. I'm the guy developing the strategy about how the a bigger team might manipulate a bunch of systems for the purposes of functional efficiency and cost efficiency and stuff. And so what's kind of neat is that working with the gyms is I get to, I, I get to play with the hands-on stuff where it makes sense. And so I, I do as much as I can by myself so that we don't have to pay somebody else to do it. And because if I build it myself, then I can structure processes around it that I find to be the most efficient that I can then pass on to somebody else to maintain that efficiency over time as we grow. Um, but yeah, I just, I think it's fun because I, I get to do the strategy and the tactical and, and see it come to fruition in, in this bizarre way of like, we have all these cool customer case studies of how strong people are getting. And I know that I play a small part in that, in how I can do my nerdy shit in the background <laughs> and do my thing that I enjoy uh, and keep us, um, keep us efficient. Yeah. The way that I, back to the, the, my buddy Connor, when I was describing the difference between me and Ben, um, the way that I, I explained Ben's role in life is that there needs to be somebody 
who understands the way technology works and not only understands the way technology works, but then also understands business so that that person can make a decision about when and how to use technology and more importantly, talk in plain, plain English to executives that also are responsible for making decisions that have no idea what the fuck they are talking about. Mm, yeah, And that might sound a little bit extreme, but I think if, if the people watching and listening had an idea of the gravity of the decisions made when it comes to technology in most companies and organizations and governments around the world and the lack of understanding uh, from the people that are making the decisions, yeah, they would be they would be deeply disturbed. <laughs> oh, so I mean, it's it's something like it's very. It's actually I try not to think about it because it's very frustrating yeah. to me because I because I do know how it works and I watch uh, important decisions get made that are clearly uninformed. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very fortunate to have had experiences that allow me to ask the question why to somebody that has a job that's different than mine, and be able to take in their response and then ask them why again and actually provide constructive criticism, feedback, suggestions, understand whether or not their business strategy uh, by itself without technology is sound. Yeah. Having been exposed to starting my own companies a few times and us having started companies together and us doing this together, um, it's cool. It's, a, it's, it's definitely, I, I think it's probably a unique position and I'm glad to be able to take advantage of it. Absolutely. And I am... Um... One other point is that whether, whether a company understands it or not, my take on this, and I've been saying this for years, is every company current day is a technology company, whether they, whether they realize it or not. Yeah. Um, because like, like us, right? We're like a us. company, we, but, we're, but we have all this technology. It's crazy. Yeah. Barbells and plates <laughs> and, and racks. Um, but how do you, how do you uh, inform your prospective audience that you exist? How do you capture their attention? How do you get them to sign up? And then how do you get them to the gym? And then how do you maintain that relationship? All of that stuff in modern day depends on technology. Yeah. And uh, each aspect of that customer life cycle that I mentioned has its own set of tools and its own set of expertise. Um, and understanding the technology that underpins all of that stuff is, is massive. Um, and, and the way most franchise companies do this is they go to a company like a Fran Connect, and then Fran Connect gives them a suite of services and says, these are the things you're going to need as a franchise company. Um, it's, I can't even, words can't describe how awful their software it's is. At first glance, it's worthless. It's, it's um, like Web 1.0, Internet Explorer, 1997. Like you have to have Windows 95 or something I, to run it. You know, it's, and oh, yeah, oh, actually, I think, was that one of the companies? Yeah. That they needed uh, a version of Internet Explorer, <laughs> like Internet Explorer 6 or 7, yeah. to run the thing. And I'm like, that doesn't exist anymore. Like, you can't, that's not a thing. And they were trying to sell it to us. Uh, and if it wasn't for each of our technology experience, we would have just, been, okay, sure, you know, like. Yeah. And that's what a bunch of companies have probably done. I can't imagine being a franchise owner that, just, that has just signed up or being a franchisor that's just signed up a franchise owner and then onboarding the franchisee or onboarding myself and then seeing this 25 year old archaic system oh, that, that is, is basically, um, unusable. Um, yeah. and, and so this, this was for all, that's for the software suite. And then we had one other requirement when it came to, um, royalties. So franchise companies make money based on taking a percentage of the gross sales of their franchisees. The way most franchise companies do this, it, well, there's a variety of ways, but it's all manual. And so Ben and I were like, well, manual equals expensive. If there's a free way to automate this, let's automate it. So we were looking at, uh, at players in the membership management space and payment space that had automatic royalty deductions so they could actually accommodate that feature request. Uh, and um, the, the implications of using the software that was proposed to us from a member experience perspective are such that I think it was called club ready. And I'm shitting on these guys because guys, you need to get it together. Like you cannot, this is, you can't be happy as our buddy Frederick says, you can't be happy with this. <laughs> uh, and Frank connect in particular are, are quite spammy in their sales process. So you guys deserve the, uh, the shitting on, um, but, but 
the, right. you you cannot when, when when customers are used to going into a coffee shop, flipping around an iPad and tapping a few things and entering their credit card and like no thought, nothing, it's just all usable. You can't then take people that are used to that experience and then pull them back 25 years and expect your franchisees or your members to be happy. Um, well, I think it demonstrates like it wouldn't sit well in my stomach to even propose that anybody affiliated with us would use such a system because I think it basically shows that we don't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. But we do give a shit. Yeah. And so we've made things a little more difficult on ourselves as a result. Much, much more difficult. But <laughs> how do you, you know, it, it, there's all these companies that I just, I, I look and I'm like, these guys don't give a shit. Yeah. What it comes down to is, is uh, the difference between purpose and, um, well, well, just it's purpose. If your purpose is simply to make money, um, you will be motivated to make, to take shortcuts like that. Yeah. The, the, yeah. my business philosophy has always been that people that are in business to just make money, there are plenty that are successful, especially at the venture capital and private equity level. They're just, you know, soulless uh, machines of, of turning profit. But the ones that are inexperienced to make these decisions um, are not thinking about the thing that's most important, which is the experiences of the people involved in the business. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you make decisions that sacrifice the experience and make it worse, those are short-term decisions that will bite you in the ass later. So this is why we are lucky to have Ben helping us out, and this is why we made all these expensive technology decisions from the outset. Indeed, and I, I, see, I see it everywhere now. Like, I, I, it just, uh, you can tell when a company has outside investment versus when it doesn't. Most companies do because not everybody has a pile of cash laying around to start a company, right? Like, you have to take on investment. That's very, that's very typical and expected. But you can, you can just, well, you, you, you have an experience with the company, see how soulless it is and go like, ah, they must be private equity backed. They must be uh, publicly traded. They must, their, their incentive structure is so far removed from customer experience or employee experience or culture or anything that's just, it, it's glaringly obvious. And it seems to me like that's becoming just all the more commonplace with every day that goes by. It seems like uh, the bar is being lowered consistently yeah. with um, the amount that people give a fuck, um, with the amount that people care about their jobs or their purpose and what they're doing productively. Um, and I think a, a lot of it is due in part to technology. This is a bit of a tangent, but it feels to me like people's attention spans are so much shorter, myself included, based on just the constant stream of stimulus we have from these devices in our pockets. And Ben and I know firsthand from being involved in technology for so long that the people making these applications and sending you these notifications don't care about your quality of life. They care about capturing your attention because if they can capture your attention, you can become engaged. If you become engaged, um, you can then be served advertisements. And that, that, that simple fact of modern life is, has such a profound impact on how we operate as a global system of humans that it's actually hard to fully quantify or wrap your head around. Yeah, yeah, it's an attention economy. And it's, um, it makes sense and it sucks. <laughs> it's it, like, I get it. I understand it. Yep. I, don't, I don't like it. Yep. You know, but. And the, the only way that we can fix that is to pay attention to things that, that deserve our attention and, and cut out the junk food bullshit from our daily attention gathering, uh, fight that, that all these different companies are having over our you know, our eyeballs essentially, right? Yeah, and the best thing to do about it is is to do it, whatever you do, you do it the right way. So then let other people do stuff the wrong way and let them have the wrong incentives and stuff. But, yep. you know, we have found ourselves in a wonderful position to do stuff the right way with a bunch of other people that want to do stuff the right way and put enormous amount of passion and we care about the outcomes and we care a lot about the people the people, I think Ray and I, I know for sure as, as brothers, I can say this confidently, like people are like number one for us. Like we're not going to do anything that wrongs the people that we're involved with. And that includes everybody that deals with us from uh, the people that we work with to the people that uh, pay us money to, to get coached at our, at our gyms. We take that trust very seriously. Uh, yeah, it's paramount. Um, and uh, so that's the right, that, I think that's the way to solve the problem is just, Hopefully more and more people will start to get shocked by this crazy way that things work and, you know, be like, ah, be all the more passionate about doing it, doing it right, even when um, everybody else is not. <laughs> Taking pride in your work and doing things with care kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Do you want your website to be like Chase Banks where they 
you know, hired a low, low cost overseas team to build something that makes absolutely no sense, doesn't adhere to enter any standard design or user experience standards. Um, and it's just, just, uh, actually difficult to achieve your goals when you sign in uh, yeah. <laughs> or do you want to take the extra step and and you know if you're not building a website whatever it is that you're building is it is it actually with the right intentions in mind and and uh, are you proud that it's it's your best work right yeah and will you survive having not drowned yourself in uh, technical debt and uh, financial debt as a result of technical mistakes <laughs> <laughs> So from from here, I've covered the main things I wanted to cover. Um, let's go wherever you want to go. We can we can talk about um, stuff on the roadmap that's kind of cool. Um, we can go further into some of the topics you've already covered. You know, for example, we can we can talk about uh, uh, some examples of the true implications of technology decisions that are being made by companies and governments around the world, <laughs> and what that means to people like us that are actually not involved, um, but our data is. Yeah. Um, any anywhere you want to go from here is fine with me. I mean, I like talking about what we're doing because I think it's fun. And uh, one of the, you know, it, uh, so I think about every, every time we have somebody that's interested in uh, opening up a starting strength gym, you know, you talk to them, I talk to them, Jen talks to them, we, we have our, our leadership team in the franchise company, we, we talk to everybody that's involved because they are, um, for uh, I guess one way to put it is they're asking to join our family. And so we want to make sure we're going to understand each other and enjoy working with each other and stuff. And one of the common ways that I structure my conversations it, when I share with them, what are we doing with technology? More importantly, why are we doing it? Um, is that I, I like to break things down into two pieces, customer acquisition and customer retention. And, and, and I, and I find that, um, I've learned this lesson the hard way that, uh, especially as a technology guy, a lot of technology guys, as far as I can tell, think that the technology and the product and the, the thing that you're selling is the most important thing. And in fact, it's quite important, of course, it's very important. But actually, from a business perspective, it's secondary to being able to get people to pay you for that thing. Like you said, finding all the sales and marketing stuff. And so um, I've, I've learned the hard way that sales and marketing is extremely important. And so i categorize in my head all of our technology work into those two buckets, customer acquisition, customer retention. So customer acquisition is sales and marketing. And how do you ethically conduct yourself in a way that can communicate like, hey, here's what it is that we have to offer. Here's what it is. Here's how it might help you. And here's why you might want to come talk to us. No hyperbole, no bullshit, just straight up. Straight up. Yeah. These are the problems that we propose to solve. And if these problems resonate with you, give us a call. You know, we've got some experts on board that are good at solving those problems. And then customer retention is the product, and in this case, the service of coaching and, and the things that facilitate that service. And that's, I call it customer retention because if you're happy with the service you're getting, you're, you will stick around. You want to continue consuming that service or consuming that product. And so I always have those buckets in my head of like, where does something fall? So that if somebody comes with an idea of like, hey, I think we should build this, or I think we should add this feature, which of those buckets does it go in? And which of those buckets currently needs the most support? Which, like really the, the broader one of our, Ray and I both, one of our favorite questions is, um, uh, what, what problem does it solve? What problem are you trying to solve? Mm -hmm. And if the problem doesn't correlate specifically to customer acquisition, and or customer retention, well, then um, we should discuss further and, you know, dig into that. But, but uh, yeah, that's the way that's the way I've adapted my that's my that's my proxy from the technical world to the business world is is those two buckets. And, and how I think about w which things belong where wasn't it a tremendously disturbing realization to have when you discovered that uh, it does not matter how good the product or the service is. If, yeah. if, if you don't have the mechanism to tell the correct audience about it in the correct way and yeah. then enable them to acquire it, um, it's completely irrelevant. Yeah, and in fact, it, 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 it uh, colors the way that I view the world because I see sales and marketing efforts by other entities, other companies, and I recognize them as such. And I recognize the fact that whatever they say 
may have nothing to do with what it is that they're selling. Right. Because they, they know what you've just pointed out, which, by the way, if all technologists in the world understood this concept, we'd be in a much better situation. <laughs> right. Which is uh, their goal is just to get you in the door. Yeah. And, and most companies will do whatever they have to do to get you in the door. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter. Slimy as can be. Yep. You know, Ye Yelp is, is like one of my favorite talking about, you know, speaking poorly of other companies. <laughs> hopefully, ho hopefully the, the Yelp uh, uh, support person that I'm currently have an open ticket with doesn't see this in time to, to uh, not close my ticket and support me. But, <laughs> but um, a Yelp salesperson call. And if any, if anybody watching is a business owner and you, you've created a Yelp profile, you'll understand what I'm talking about. The moment you put in, because you put in like they tell you, okay, where's your shop, right? What's your address? What's your phone number? What's your website? So then they call you. And so they called me yesterday because I created a Yelp listing for one of our new gyms. And uh, they, the, the woman started off the conversation with, uh, hey, yeah, I see you guys are opening up a new gym. I'm just curious if you're trying to get new, you know, an additional business or if, or if you're, uh, you're trying to grow. Or, or looking for new leads, wasn't it? Or look, or yeah, looking yeah, yeah. for new leads. <laughs> And I just laughed and I was like, have you talked to any business owners that have said no? <laughs> like, I think I'm going to fall for that. I know your you sales know? process. <laughs> so I, I, I see it for what it is. I, I understand that you're on the sales team. I have nothing against you personally. I hate the company you work for, uh, but I don't hold it against you. And I understand your job at sales and marketing. I realize that it has nothing to do necessarily with your product. Um, you know, but then when you find those companies that line those things up, you know, like we were looking at Filson the other day, a clothing company. They've been uh, making clothing in, in the state of Washington for like 120, 130. Something, 1890, They still make all the same stuff they've been making forever. And they still make it in Washington, but with real people that care. And their sales and marketing lines up with their products. Like they're all aligned. Yep. And um, it's a beautiful thing. Whenever I find a company like that, I'm like, I, if I... If I had a bunch of money, I would give it to you and buy all of your stuff. Yeah, because you know I love that. <laughs> it, it would be a uh, a real fun episode of some kind if we could record all of the franchise owners' conversations with the Yelp reps. <laughs> right, because they all get called by Yelp, especially Jay Livesey. Um, <laughs> Jay's pretty fun with these guys. The guy to Denver, because uh, Yelp is uh, is basically an extortion ring. Yeah, that's dirty, man. They're yeah. gross. Um, they they are not ethical, and their salespeople. Uh, are extremely aggressive, yeah. and uh, the conversations are hilarious. They, and they, they try to lie to me about technical things, and I'm like, listen, man, you've got the wrong guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. what's that Parks and Rec guy's name? Uh, Ron Swanson? Ron Swanson. Yeah. I know more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> no joke, I've, I've, I almost never say that to anybody because it's such a stupid thing to say, but I said that to one of the Yelp sales guys because <laughs> he's trying to tell me about, well, you know, you could, do, and I said, listen, man, just stop. I've been doing this for longer than you have. I don't need your advice. Yeah. And he refused to take me, put me on the do not call list and started yelling at me and stuff. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's uh, amazing. It was, yeah, it's a special. That's a special company. Yeah. Um, this is the social credit score for your company instead of as an individual. Yeah. And the, the, the organization that, that sets the standards, policies, and practices for your company's social credit score is completely corrupt and has the wrong incentives. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it tells you everything you need to know about the leadership team at a given company when people behave in a certain way. Yep. Bad or good. Yep. Yep. You know, when, when, when people behave in ways that are, that are upstanding, their leadership team is most likely upstanding. And we try our best, I think, to, uh, to be one of those. So let, let's get into the woods, uh, weeds rather, uh, we can stay out of the woods, although your shirt would apply. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> let's get into the weeds of some of the tech in the, okay. in the gyms other than the, the apps that you've, you've built. So, um, Let's talk about the sound system. We'll give a shout out to our, our buddy, Patrick Spence at Sonos. He runs that company now. He used to yeah. uh, be one of my managers at BlackBerry. Um, uh, you've got some interesting, you've gone pretty deep on lighting, for example. Yeah. So for those of you that have stuck around this long, I'm guessing you'll want this level of nerdiness. Yeah, um, if you're still listening now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, can talk, uh, we can talk decisions for front door locks. Uh, yeah, for sure. Actually. So <laughs> yeah, in fact, so if you go into any of our gyms, you'll notice that, um, well, you'll be you'll see TVs. That's a piece of technology. You'll see a couple pieces of technology, but 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 um, what you won't see is that there's there is no there's no tech there's no server room in the back. There's no network closet. There are no computers. We have we don't have computers 
With the exception of the iPad. In our gym. Yeah. I mean, the iPad's a computer, but I mean, like, we don't have, like, traditional... Like a desktop. Most small businesses have a computer in the back doing something, even if it's just recording the security cameras. No computers. We have no... I don't want computers in our gyms. Explain why. <laughs> what a weird thing to say, right? Yeah. The IT yeah. guy doesn't want computers. Because computers have to be maintained. Right. So th this, is, this is the difference between IT guys that are into IT and IT guys that understand business. Um, if you're an IT guy that understands business, you understand that IT is an expense. It's a problem or a problem waiting to happen. And uh, yeah. you know, the more complexity you have on site, the more support you need on site, and the more failure points you have on site. Yeah. What I, what I look at is so, so we have the, so the technology in our gyms is as follows. TV screens at least one iPad, sometimes two, depending on the gym, uh, one Sono speaker, four or five cameras, you know, like two inside, two outside, sometimes three inside, depending on the size and the shape of the gym. Uh, oh, and a Wi-Fi system, because everything now uses Wi-Fi. Um, that's it. And, and a every component of that, we go, okay, we need sound, we want music, we want uh, security cameras, we want um, door locks. Oh, door. Well, the door lock systems we have are explicitly not technical. They're all mechanical. There's no, our door locks are not computerized, nor are they Wi-Fi connected. And that was difficult to achieve because the Terribly. people that wanted to sell you door locks wanted to sell you technology. Oh, right? they, and they, cause they think it's a good thing, but, uh, but you could buy this Wi-Fi connected door lock and you can access it from your phone and say, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want our door lock on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, now what I did with each of those pieces was like, what can we do that will serve the purpose that will last as long as it could possibly last and has all the, f the fewest number of components involved because every additional component is something that has to be maintained. It's something that can break. It's something that will eventually need to be replaced. So all of our stuff is consumer grade, generally reliable, highly functional, basically zero maintenance. So we've had- And easily replaceable. Super easily replaceable. Our security cameras cost $25. And they're damn good. Damn good. Yeah. And, if, and, and, and if they, and I'll shout out to WISE, W-Y-Z-E security cameras. I love them. If one breaks or whatever, which they actually don't. Like they, I've, I've stress tested them myself and they've been stress tested now at our gym since 2018. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but if one breaks and you, 25 bucks, you just replace it. Right. You yep. know, and, yep. and you don't have to have a technical expert on site to replace it. Anybody can just plug it in. Um, so that our gyms are as non-technical as they can be while, you know, while still being, um, as useful as possible and as nice as possible. And, and in fact, the lighting systems too, there's a lot of lights. So I, I work with our sister, Jen. So we have a, you know, our company is not only are we, um, family is like extended family with people that we have, that we call family, even though we're not blood related, but we actually, uh, Ray and Jen and I are brothers and, and sister. Um, so Jen and I work on the lighting systems together and, and, and even then the lights, the, the lights in the ceiling that just flip the switch, the place lights up that there's people that try to sell you technology for that, for connecting your lights to the internet. And, and the, oh, well, I forgot. We have thermostats. Our thermostats are on Wi-Fi too. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, we, it's all minimized. I think it's a nice, uh, difference from from the experience that we have all day every day living in in 2021 maybe 2022 by the time you see this um you know how much screen time do you spend each day and each week between your phone and your laptop when you come into a starting strength gym for a lot of people myself included we finally get the opportunity to train at a gym now that starting strength boise is opened where we live um it's a it's a it's a vacation it's uh, it's your your meditation time. It's your it's your time. The best way to put it is it's it's your time to do something for yourself, where you can focus on the task at hand. And there's something meditative about that, which is which is psychologically comforting, um, and it helps you look forward to it. Because when you when you walk into a starting strength gym, there's no salesperson, there's no receptionist, there's no sales desk, there's a lobby. And the lobby is there. Yeah, there's tech, but the tech tells you, what am I lifting right now? And also, who's kicking my ass on the leaderboard? Mm, yeah. And then you change your shoes on the bench, you put your shoes in the cubby, you go to your rack, and then you train. And at the end of the session, you pull out your digital logbook app, 
um, which is really well designed, by the way. Uh, our designer on, the, on this stuff, Keith Barney, thank you for the hard work on that. Yep. Awesome. Um, everything looks really sharp. And then you, uh, you plug in what you're doing for your next workout, and then everything else is handled behind the scenes. So it's technology for us, the way I look at it is, it's meant to enhance the experience and make things simpler, but we don't have tech just to have tech. That's right. We don't like the bright, shiny objects. The purpose of what you're doing in the gym is to become a better version of yourself, and you have a coach that's there to guide you through that, but between you being present and focused, the equipment, and the person standing behind your shoulder telling you what to do, those are the things that are important. Yeah. And we don't need 3D cameras or gyroscopes or bar path monitors or any of this, or heart rate monitors or any of this other stuff that dis distracts from you getting under the bar and doing five more pounds than you did last workout. Yeah, that's the beautiful part about the service that we offer is it's, it's uh, purely timeless and simple in the way that it's, that it's uh, delivered. It's human to human. You know, and and the coaches, the objective with our technology also for the coaches. So we, you know, I have I have to consider in our technology implementations, um, primarily our our customers, our clients, um, the coaches, the franchise owners, and then also the franchise company. Each one has a set of requirements that interfaces with all of our systems, whether we've built them or bought them. And uh, one of the things is the coaches, like the coach should not be bothered with anything but coaching and coaching is uh, a process that's delivered via verbal communication and physical presence there's no technology required to do coaching properly right in our gyms and i and so we've made an explicit decision that like we don't want coaches to be bothered with technology while they're trying to do their job the sign-in process, you know. um, selling. We don't want coaches selling. We just want them coaching. Yeah, we, have, we don't even have, we, the, in fact, our gyms don't even have any salespeople. Right, right. I mean, ultimately, someone has to be in the gym when there's a, a prospective member that comes in to show them what we do and see if it's a good fit. Um, but this is more of a consultation. This is more of a going into a dentist and seeing if the services that they offer matches the, the problem that yeah. you have. This isn't from a, a coach. Right. And not, 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 cause it's not from the sales and marketing person who's on the customer acquisition side. This coach is on both sides, right? They have to, they have, cause then if you agree and walk in the door, that same coach is now on the line to deliver the service up to the expectations that were set. Ben is fully aware of this dynamic because most useful technologists some, at some point in their career or constantly, uh, if not constantly, have had the situation where the sales and marketing team over promises by a factor of, you know, whatever, 10 plus, uh, and, then, and then gets the deal done, signs a contract, and then passes that, that mess to the technology team to try to make something yeah. happen that is quite literally physically impossible to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been there many times before I knew any better. I used to have salespeople that would drag me into these government contract meetings and go, and I'm the tech, I'm just, I'm purely technical at this point. I have no understanding of business. You know, this is in 2007 ish and, uh, get dragged into these meetings and, um, they go, yeah, this is our senior technical guy, Ben, here. And, hey, Ben, we, we're, we're telling these guys we can do X, Y, and Z. Can, can you tell us about X, Y, and Z? I'll tell them about it and then go away and find out that it was written into a contract and that actually, like, I can do X, Y, and Z, but none of the people on the contract can. <laughs> and, then, and then there's a lawsuit because, the, because we didn't deliver the services to the expectations and all this kind of, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I had no idea that's what I was participating in, but <laughs> yeah, there's some bait and switch that happens there too, isn't <laughs> For there? Sure. Oh, yeah. every time, all the major, all major uh, contracts, outsourcing contracts, and uh, go through that. Um, that's why I'm so nervous to use um, agencies and things that because that's what they do. Yeah, you know, they just they just lie. Yeah. Um, As a general rule, we prefer to hire contractors where we are not their only source of income. Um, they do what they do for a living. They've been doing it for a long time. They're professionals, they're experienced, and they don't have an agency between us and them because the agency is another layer and more layers equal, equals more expense and additional communication breakdown. Yeah, it's a telephone game. Yep. It's a telephone game with bad incentives. Yep, exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. A, I don't know if I don't play that game. <laughs> so whether it's marketing or sales or you name it, we, uh, you know, graphic design, uh, yeah. we like working with the person that 
does the work. <laughs> right. Yeah. You don't need a proxy. Right. But yeah, I say, you know, going back to the simplicity of the gyms and the and the, op, the and our simplicity of our operations with respect to technology, I think we've done really well there. You know, um, because the technology does exist. Obviously, there's still occasional things where silly stuff, right? A coach will message me because they got locked out of their email account. No big deal. But but it's not that they're like every day burdened by some crappy thing that they're forced to use just so that they can then go coach. Yeah, there there are. Uh, I would be scared to know what the percentage is, but but a significant proportion of companies on Earth right now, where if their technology fails and their their technology is probably built on a house of cards, they cannot conduct business. Yeah, um, and and uh, other than the billing relationship, that that doesn't really apply to us. If we have to go to bartering, you know, if this whole thing collapses and we have to barter for strength training, so be it. <laughs> That's right. I mean, if it, well, and in fact, if all of our technology went away, we would struggle a lot from a sales and marketing perspective. But we could still operate our gyms. Yeah, absolutely. You know, which is yeah. pretty beautiful. Um, so, in summary, the technologist is telling you guys don't uh, to avoid technology. <laughs> yes, avoid technology. That's right. In fact, I'll, uh, the couple of podcasts I've done with Ripito have been along those very same lines. We're like, just whatever you do, do not use technology. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. It, it, it will be the end of you from a privacy perspective or a, who knows. I mean, it's it's uh, it's crazy. But nonetheless, we all use it to a great extent. And um, the people building it have a mixed set of incentives most often, you know, so let's go into, let's go into tier three nerdiness just for the people that have made it this far. <laughs> oh, um, tell us about, tell us about <laughs> the, the decisions you've made around lighting in the gyms and what, what went through your mind and, uh, why you decided on what you decided. Well, the, I'm into photography and uh, have been for a long time and actually have a side gig as a professional photographer and, uh, certain types of photography revolve around uh, photography is the process of capturing light, right? And so if you can manipulate the light, you can manipulate the outcome of the photography. Well, the same thing is going through when we use our eyes, the way that photons are entering our eyes, similarly, is obviously capturing light, right? And recognizing a scene and, and the, the way that uh, something looks and the way that our gyms look affects the way that it's obviously, you know, perceptions are reality kind of a thing. Like what, what type of, you know, when you walk into like a luxury store versus the dollar store, one of the things that'll be different is the lighting amongst many other things, but the lighting and how carefully it's crafted and how those photons hit your eyeballs and which photons do, and which photons don't and how they paint shadows and, uh, or the lack of shadows and how harsh or soft light might be. So I, my objective with the lighting in the gyms, and I think we've achieved it pretty well, is to be generally softly lit. What, and what that means is that there's an overall lack of shadows. And so, um, in fact, our scene right now in this video, uh, I, helped, I helped Ray, this is Ray's podcast studio, and I helped him put together the lighting. And you'll notice there's a, well, I don't know which finger's which. Oops. There's a shadow. There's my shadow right behind me right there. Right. So that's a bit of an example of almost a, a hard light scenario. Um, and I don't want shadows in our gyms because um, they are distracting. And I don't think they look I don't think they present a crisp, clean because you, you put together the you worked on the overall design aesthetic of the gyms overall and in, of, of being of clean. And there's a lot of white and it's, it's crisp and everything is uh, there's a lot of symmetry and everything is planned, and I mean down to the, like the millimeter. And I, you know, our sister Jen is like literally doing things down to the millimeter. Quite literally. <laughs> Quite literally. She will tell you the fraction of an inch where everything is placed. And um, along those lines, I, the shadows uh, present, the more shadows there are, the more dramatic an environment can feel. And our gyms are not dramatic. We're not about drama, as you might have been able to tell so far. We're about... <laughs> you know, realism and, and, and enjoyment. And, but also this, you know, it's a design thing. It's a style thing. Yep. And so the way that you achieve an environment that minimizes shadows is you have lights that are large in the surface area in which the light's being emitted, which, and sometimes you might be using an led that's very small, like, a, uh, it might be smaller than this circle in my hand. 
Um, and if you emit light from that small surface, it will create hard shadows. And so you might want to bounce it off of a diffuser, for example, and diffuse the light to uh, simulate a large lighting source. And so we have, if you go in our gyms and look up, which if you're bench pressing, you are looking up, you'll notice that it doesn't hurt your eyes, right? You can, you can stare straight at the lights in our ceilings and, it, and you're not like, it, it, in, in fact, for me, anyway, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but for me, when I bench in our in our Boise gym, uh, I'm I'm looking up at, at one of the lights usually, and, and it doesn't even change the. Don't, I don't wrinkle my forehead. You know what I mean? It doesn't affect my. I don't have to squint my eyes. So there's a there's a customer client experience component there, and then also nowadays a big thing is looking good in photography and social media posts, in an environment that's well lit can be captured in beautiful ways by cameras that are small, like cell phones. So that our gym owners and coaches and clients can all take pictures and videos if they choose to do so, and they will look good. Yep. Just grab your iPhone out of your pocket, and you are essentially in a photo studio yeah. already. Yeah, you're in this like yeah studio environment that's well lit, that... Uh, the, the, the brighter and softer the lights are, the, the better the pictures will look for the most part, the crisper and cleaner they'll be because the, if you're into photography, you'll understand like ISO values, the more, the more photons, the more lumens than the lower the ISO that's necessary, which means a cleaner, uh, image. Yep. So the, now achieving that involves choosing how many, so which light fixtures diffuse the light effectively across the entire surface area of the panel with, that is outputting the light? How many of those panels do you place in the ceiling, depending on the type of ceiling? How far apart do you place them? How far from the walls and all the outer edges? You know, how, how densely do you pack those light sources in a way that's cost effective, but also effective for the lighting? And um, so we use, you know, we have this like 3D modeling tool that we use that if uh, I've kind of decided how many lumens I want to hit each square foot of the floor. And then, uh, and then um, based on the height of the ceiling and the, and the volume of the gym, we can specify the types of fixtures and the quantity and the density of the fixtures um, in a cost-effective way that makes it such that those many lumens fall on the floor and, and, and then that have as minimal amount of shadows as possible. We have one gym that went off the rails and did their own lighting. We won't mention who, because we, <laughs> we love the guy, and he's uh, doing a lot for, of good yeah, things. But so yeah. no, no need to uh, mention the, the, the minor fuck up. Yeah, but we just, we just like to poke fun. We like to poke fun. Th this gym does not have the lighting that we <laughs> have as our standard, and it's pretty obvious when you look at the photos. Um, if any of you happen to know what that gym is, or you want to look at the gym social media, and you want to uh, let me know, post, post your answer to the Starting Strength Forum. Um, <laughs> under the starting train Jim's thread and uh, I'll send you something if, if you get it right <laughs> first person to do it I'll, I'll send you something yeah it's, that, that is I, I'm glad you brought up the lights because it's just one of the who knows how many things that we consider to the finest level of detail right because right. it matters right it, it the simplicity of what has been created looks a whole lot uh less complex than than and that's the goal than it actually is behind yeah. the scenes yeah the goal is to um reduce complexity and simplify as much as possible um and the the, the cool thing about you in this role and your experience is i can talk to a technologist about what our brand stands for and the aesthetic we're trying to achieve and then ben has the capability to translate that from a technology perspective, and not just from a user interface on a digital screen, but also a physical interface with the lighting environment, for example. Yeah, it's great, man. I love that stuff. I'm like the guy in office space that, uh, you know, I talk to the engineers so the customer doesn't have to. That was a ridiculous scene, and the Bobs uh, didn't like that answer. Yeah. You know, I'm a people person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people person, damn it. But uh, uh, <laughs> if you have never worked with software engineers, um, it's, it's hard to explain. They're, they're a different breed. People like Ben that uh, find peace and solitude and working in server rooms, for example, um, operate a little bit differently than the rest of us. And finding the missing link like Ben that can communicate on both sides is super useful. 
and just in case anyone uh, is is watching this, that's a current franchisee or a prospective franchisee. We've uh, uh, we've made Ben a shareholder in the company, so he can't leave. I mean, he can leave, but he, he has an incentive not to. Um, <laughs> he, he can leave. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't want. It'd it. be a bad idea. Um, and we and we did that because uh, although we're in the gym business and we're a franchising company. Um, Technology is unbelievably important, and there are so many things that can go wrong, catastrophically wrong, yeah. every day with major companies all around the world. You know, targets, data breach, you name it, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, we're there are not many people on earth like Ben, and we're really lucky to have you. So thanks for what you do, man. Well, I think it's just great. It's so fun, man. We get, you know, I get to help people get strong. My favorite thing, and and I know other people have said this is involved in the business. My favorite thing is when the older uh, women that are part of our client base get strong is my favorite thing, man. Like it just, it about puts me to tears every time I see the, the case studies, you know, on these wonderful women that, 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 you know, I don't know how else to put it. They have the balls, <laughs> you, you know, to go do a thing that's, that's otherwise scary. Yeah. And that their friends are like, Oh, you can't do that. You're going to break your back and blah, blah. You know, it's like, yeah. No, no. <laughs> and they're the toughest ones in the gym oh, most it's the, of the time. Oh, it's Complain the, the least, there's, they grind the hardest. There's um, uh, Pam, I will, I'll just use first name just for, you know, to be respectful. But uh, Pam, and I hope Pam watches this, in our gym is uh, one of those women who is such a badass. And, 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 oh, I hope I'm not wrong. I think Pam, gosh, I hope I'm not over, doing your age wrong. I think she's around 70 and she's a badass. And, and I, and I lift with her twice a week and I, and I watch her struggle through, but, but cleanly, like she executes a good squat and a good bench press. The other day I see all these like muscle fibers ripping down her forearm as she's bench pressing. <laughs> I'm like, hey, <laughs> You're getting jacked. So uh, anyways, I just love it. H how long was that, uh, that final rep of her 130 pound deadlift the other day? Which is, of course, her PR. She's it, still doing a linear progression. Oh, she 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 will drag that bar up her legs until it's done. Yeah, I mean, she puts effort, man. Yeah, a unending effort. And Paul was thinking that uh, that thing wouldn't go right because no. it was just. And her husband too, Dave, is hilarious, and he's he's doing a wonderful job himself. But I just, for some reason, it's the women that I just really get a kick out of. Yeah, out of watching. One of my favorite case studies, by the way, is this gal Kathleen out of Denver. So if you're looking for YouTube content to watch, go check out. Type in uh, Kathleen starting strength. That should pop right up. Yeah. Good. Well, that's everything I wanted to cover. Anything else you want to add cool. before we wrap up? Oh man, yeah. I mean, I, I enjoy the, all the technical, nuanced, and details stuff. But we'll. Uh, I think we pretty well covered the what needs to be covered. We can always do round two. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being on. All right. right Thanks, on. guys. See ya.